Welcome to the new format of Human Factors Cast. This is Human Factors Cast, episode 25. We got a great show for you guys today. We're going to be taking a trip down memory lane as we remember the past. We'll take a look into all the exciting Human Factors news of the week, and we'll make predictions for 2017. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey, everybody. And Blake Arnstor. What is going on? I'm excited, guys. We're here. We're back. We are starting a new format today, this week. This is exciting stuff. I'm Brand always new show type. I always, yeah, I always feel like I'm excited on the show. Um, how we doing? We good? There's, L- love it. How I'm you doing? doing all right. There's a lot of interesting. I like the idea of experimenting around with different formats of a show. You know, I think it's, I think it's healthy, and it gives us to, the fans to fans to respond to what we're doing. I think so too, and I think this new format, uh, a lot of our fans are going to enjoy because we are actually taking a look at all the human factors news. There is. I mean, we've searched far and wide, and there's no one source that sort of collates all this human factors news. And so we're here to bring it to you. Uh, this could be anything. So uh, this is this first part of the show is all about human factors news. This could be anything from virtual reality, automation, psychology, design, anything that has to deal with the field of human factors. So, Billy, take it away. What's up first? So the Internet blew up this week. From a video from 1999 that featured uh, the immortal star child David Bowie in an interview with the BBC. According to Bowie, the internet is where all the fun stuff is happening. But he had a hard time convincing the interviewer, Jeremy Paxton, Paxman, I think. The interviewer made a claim that the future of the internet is hugely exaggerated. Bowie wasn't taking it, taking it and shot back about how people who doubted that things like the telephone would change the world. He described it as an alien life form and also talked about breaking technology barriers, both culturally and socially. Now, we recognize this is truth, but as a scientist, you guys, what do you guys think is next? Well, that's kind of hard to to imagine, right? I mean, I don't know. What do you think is next, Blake? Well, it, yeah, I don't know. You could argue <laughs> it's going to be an expansion of the Internet, right? Like it becoming... Because there's a lot of talk about like nanotechnology being implanted in the brain in the future, right? And I can that see that becoming like mm-hmm. a really big thing, like this the the whole idea of a hive mind. So I feel like that's that's the ultimate place of where we're going. I think that's really interesting. I mean, you you think about downloading procedural tasks, like I want to know how to cook this. I'm just going to download that, and suddenly I know how to do that. That's that's going to be crazy. Well, it, that becomes also like an issue of space then. Because I don't know how how it. Well, you don't need to you don't need to retain it. I, I'm gonna download this to figure out how to make spaghetti squash, and then I'm gonna delete it and you know save save the important things like who I am, my identity, and then just the procedural stuff I'll come in and replace. Now, before we go any further, though, I do have a clip of this, um, and I, I really like what he's saying here. Hang on, I'm gonna see if I can cue it up. Mm-hmm. No, you see, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. End. I don't agree. I think the internet. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. Now, that's really interesting because I mean, he's he's nailed it, man. Like this is back in 1999. Before, I mean. You know, right, you, right, right. You could kind of see this stuff is coming, but uh, but man. still, like that early on, coming from David Bowie to just really pinpoint, like it's going to bring good and great things, but it's going to have a massive effect on the way that life goes. Oh, he nailed it. Well, I think it, I think it had the biggest effect on like things like music and show business, especially you know the rise of the YouTube star, the idea of videos being out there, being able to have like 
not just a certain amount of bands or who you actually shelled out money for CDs and cassettes for, but actually having a wide variety of music to choose from because of the internet and things like that. Wasn't this around the time of things like Napster and 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 music sharing and things like that? No, this is closer to AOL. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, but still, mm-hmm. I mean, you even bring up an interesting point because it connects us all in such a way. But even for the music industry, it kind of had a backfiring. Um... Yeah. I mean, you take the good, you take the bad. When you're downloading that recipe to make a, a squash dish, you might also get an advertisement jingle stuck in your head as well. Uh, yeah. And, and then it, it's like it's like spam where you can't like uninstall it. Ooh, how bad <laughs> yeah, would that be? So that song is stuck in your head the whole day. Oh, man. All right, Billy, what's next? All right, so I got this one from CNET. CNET released an article on what the hot tech was in 1997. Way back when. And uh, I thought it would be fun. We thought it would be fun to step to it like, you know, a time machine and go in your way back machine and reminisce about the good old days of flip phones and all, that were all the rage and DVD players and the OG PlayStation, you know, Gigapets and Windows 95, Palm Pilots. Uh, and of course, let's not forget unlimited internet access. You know, even that hot new format we just kind of talked about—the MP3. So, uh, how did all your? How long did all your gigapets live? And uh, Blake, N64 or PlayStation? So my gigapets, gigapets did not live. <laughs> <laughs> Answers that it's question. Still a soft spot in your heart. <laughs> yeah, I was never very good at that. But it, but I can't answer a little better the N64 versus PlayStation because I still have the N64. Woo. And I was hanging out playing with <laughs> playing N64 with my girlfriend over the weekend. There so, you go. What Mario Party? That thing is classic. Hang on. Mario, Mario Party. Smash Brothers. Smash Brothers. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That's some good that, stuff. Uh, Golden yeah. Eye. Golden Eye. Golden Eye. Yes, yeah, no, we still have our uh, 64 here as well. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. Uh, this this So this article was really cool, man. Like, just kind of looking back and going, wow, this this stuff was cutting edge back then. I mean, did you guys like wait in line for Windows ninety five? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Out in the cold and the snow. Yes. Um, man, I'm looking back at all these. Like, I had a DVD player. I had a Gigapad. I had a Palm Pilot, and we had just gotten internet, er, unlimited internet yeah. access in the home. And that was like, yeah, it was just all. That was the craziest one for me because I remember being at my grandmother's house just using dial-up was the only internet we ever had. And right. It, like, it would oh, never and that work. classic sound. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I wish I had the sound bite. only we had the bit, yeah. <laughs> but I think the internet you, and then the DVD you know, players was the biggest thing for me, for sure. You know, one of the things I was curious about is what do you think went into the ergonomic testing of, like, the N64 controller? Oh, there was you know, none. Because there... that's such a weird controller. <laughs> there was absolutely zero, I can tell you right now, because there were so many problems with it. Like, humans don't have three hands. <laughs> sure they do. It's just the other one's hidden. <laughs> it was it's such true. a strange They design. kind of went all over the place with it. But I think it was trying – it was – there was at least some effort, right? Because it's trying to – handle for right-handed and left-handed people by having that weird funky design yeah but if they were it's trying so if they were trying to handle for right and left-handed people they would have they would have mirrored it on both yeah, sides the buttons would be everywhere like too. Yeah. yeah i don't know there was oh there's this really cool um hack or somebody kind of um somebody like melded together two n64 controllers so you know how you can play golden eye with the two sticks mm-hmm. um they melded together two of them, so it's just one controller. Oh, but you insane. have the outrigger ones on the outside. It, it, yeah, it's crazy looking. Beautiful. All right, Billy. <laughs> That's crazy. Billy, we're still down memory lane. What's up next year? Speaking of older technology, 2017 marks the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. And everyone really considers the iPhone a, a, a revolutionary, revolutionary uh, phone for the phone industry. Now, Blake, you recently got a new iPhone. So how does it feel using 10-year-old technology? So this is really interesting to me because I did buy an iPhone when it first came out, like Gen 1. And in a lot of ways, it hasn't changed that much. And it still keeps that the same singular mm-hmm. model of like the one hard button and a bunch of just apps mm-hmm. you download. The only thing that's really changed is the amount of interactions they've added within the UI. Um but it's uh, it's mm. it's crazy. It's been ten years. That's yeah. really freaking me out. <laughs> I uh, I watched the original. <laughs> I watched the original. Uh, you know when Steve Jobs got up there and said, "We're gonna put this screen in your pocket, and it's a phone." 
and just it cha- it really did revolutionize the way that we interact with tech. It was the first touchscreen phone to where you could actually it's it's a completely different form of interaction that we hadn't seen before that point. And I don't think I like prior to the iPhone. I think I still had like a Nokia phone that was just like that green background where you could just only do phone call and text, and that was it. Right. I had a uh, I had a Palm Pilot before uh, before. I guess I got... I had Android. I was never an iPhone person. Never, ever. <laughs> oh! I had a BlackBerry myself, and oh. I used to type away at that sucker all day long. There you go. All right, Billy, let's get into some Human Factors news. What's up next? All right, so Stanford researchers have created an alternate center, alternative centrifuge that costs just a few cents to run without a charge. All right, so it, from what I gathered, it works by threading a uh, circular object and pulling at the end of either side, which makes the circular object spin at the same RPMs as a regular centrifuge. Now, when I first heard this story, I thought to myself, it sounds like someone on a bicycle just pedaling really, really hard, you know? Yeah, so... Uh, what do you guys think? So, so this, it's actually more akin to, um, you kind of pull outward... You pull outward and the disc spins as these threads kind of, you know, it's, it, it, it's weird to describe. I mean, you kind of got to watch a video of it. And we thankfully we'll post all the, the show notes here. You can follow the link and, and see the video. But, uh, it, yeah, you kind of pull on the sides and it just the, um, the little circular object in the middle that would, you know, presumably act as a centrifuge spins at the same amount of RPM. And so, you don't have to have these expensive machines. It's just manpower. That's incredible. Like, especially thinking about how much those machines usually cost. And now we're talking about yeah. doing it without, like it can run without a charge. Yeah. Ooh. That's just good. So, so, Low tech rules. So to me, human factors plays a big role here because uh, now you're going to have to consider the human is <laughs> literally just pulling these things apart to, you know, make the centrifuge go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cracks me up. Like, it almost you, seems like you a have reusable to, thing at that point. You have to deal with issues of fatigue. You to... <laughs> uh, well, medical that... scientists are going to get so swole. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're gonna just going to be a beast. You don't even have to go to the gym after work. Okay. Nah, nah. I, I centrifuge all day. Do you even <laughs> centrifuge, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, one thousand uh, dollars is how much these centrifuges cost, I think, and this thing can be made for twenty cents. So, I mean, just the just the cost alone. Who cares about manual labor, right? Yeah, we can we can build machines wouldn't that go. Wouldn't more tests have? Wouldn't more tests have to be done before they actually uh, go through with actually putting these things in hospitals oh, oh. and testing blood samples and stuff? Oh yes, yes, Certainly. yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, this is just. Uh, you know, a, a cool idea that someone had, and who knows if it'll ever see the light of day. We might still use the uh, archaic one thousand dollar technology. I don't. Know. Yeah, <laughs> the high tech stuff. The high tech stuff. Yeah. Uh, speaking of high tech stuff, Billy, what's up next? This one's cool. So this one I'm actually pretty jazzed about. So Nintendo held a press conference on Friday, which everybody probably knows about, about the new uh, Nintendo Switch. This thing is a handheld hybrid console it's a- and the new console will feature game cartridges so the rise of the game cartridges again 32 gigabytes of storage and supports up to six eight w- systems over wi-fi and then it it boasts a six and a half hour battery life so this thing's going to be available on march around 300 bucks so what do you guys think of the nintendo switch and when can human factors cast get a free copy well, I think I think this is an ergonomic nightmare. Uh, really? Absolutely. Really? Okay. Absolutely. You have like seventeen different parts. Okay. So let me break this down. So we have um this is oh god, this is such a mess. I'm gonna rip into this thing. And this is not me hating on Nintendo, everyone. This is me hating on the design of this thing. This is okay. Let me break it down. First off, this is a console that you can pull out of the dock so you can play it on your screen at home. Or you can play it on the go. Now, the way this works, there is literally a screen inside the dock, uh, and the dock goes to your TV, right? So you pull out the screen, and now there's two handles that you have to attach to either side. Now, these handles can either be attached to the screen, they can be attached to a center um, 
piece that kind of links them together like a like a regular controller and then you have additional pieces that kind of fit onto the the wings themselves to kind of act as like a uh, like a grip uh, and they provide extra battery life now as if that wasn't bad enough you can then use these things as individual controllers themselves like uh you know like the wii mode kind of yeah like uh-huh, each uh-huh. each wing will be its own thing but they're not symmetrical they're it's just okay my final point <laughs> I, I, I'm almost done. I'll let you guys. I'll let you guys say your piece here in a sec. My final point: one of the big selling points is that you can literally put this tablet up in a kickstand mode and play it sitting mm-hmm. back, right? So you can like play it on the train or on the plane or whatever. Uh, it can just sit on your lap or whatever. But it, it stands on a kickstand. Now, who's the idiot that designed this thing with the USB on the bottom? So I can't plug this in and play it in kickstand mode. I can't charge it and play it at the same time. That's just dumb to me. Okay, you guys go. I'm done. I've said my piece. So for the the kickstand thing, uh, I don't know how it looks. I mean, my whole opinion of it at a high level is that it was an awesome idea. The execution was just kind of poor. But other other than that, I mean, I think there are some strange choices they made with the like the amount of parts they have and what you can do to make the actual single controller like what you were talking about yeah. like adding grips and all that and it is it's a little i don't know it seems like a bad idea that they put the charging mechanism at the bottom where it's supposed to kickstand this, but that could be related to it sitting in whatever what would you call it the earlier. dock yeah sitting yeah, in the dock itself i can see that but i mean at least provide another charger any the this is the equivalent this is the video game equivalent to me of apple's airpods like this things are going to get lost this this really? is just a yeah. this is a nightmare. This is a, where am I going to put all my pieces? How how am I going to transport these effectively without worrying that something's going to fall off and get lost? All right, Billy, I know you want to say some stuff. Go ahead. Well, I mean, like first of all, I feel this system is really what a stepping stone, right? Because the most successful systems that Nintendo has ever that has brought out in the last few years have always been the DSs and the 3DSs. Everybody loves those systems, and this is just kind of a natural progression. They're kind of doubling down on that idea of the handheld go-around thing. My real question for this system is, is, yeah, the pieces are going to be hard to find and hard to get. I get that part. You're right on that sense. But what I'm wondering is, is how durable is this console? Because this console is made for family and kids. and They want you to be active. They want you to run around with this thing. So the question is, how durable is it? You know, that's really what I want to know. Probably not very. It looks just like any other tablet to me. We'll find out I mean, shortly. You're going to be putting this in the hands of children. That's the thing. You know what, though? All this being said, Nintendo, if you'd love to send Human Factors Cast a copy of this to change our minds, please do. This <laughs> is We might not, but because we have integrity. We do. But... I mean, you know, this would be this I'm I'm actually working on right now trying to get an advanced copy of this and it would be amazing to review this ergonomically because I just I will bring someone like Woodrow on the show, someone who's versed in ergonomics and just just have them have a go at it. Um but wow, am I just I'm uh, uh and, But I am really excited about this system because like I said, it's a stepping stone. I really do would love to get to the point of having a system or a gaming system that I can take everywhere with me that's powerful enough or at least close to powerful enough as a home console. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I, I, I get your point. Uh, one thing I'm excited about is cartridges. Those don't scratch. Uh, and I'm very... Yeah! I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, blowing off the cartridge to make it work again. All right, Billy. <laughs> what's, up, what's up next, buddy? All right, so... This one was a little confusing to me. So the U.S. regulatory agency overseeing federal-level transportation announced a new official community committee on automation. And the new committee will c- cover autonomous driving, drones, and any other form of getting from point A to point B. The committee is apparently going to solicit help from industry experts and creating policy and identifying research areas and so this is a huge topic for human factors. But wasn't this stuff already put in? So, Nick, help me break this down. Sure. So so the big news is that now 
there, th- well, before there were no real like hard lines on what automation can and can't do on the road. Um, I, I'm blanking uh-huh. on the company name, but a company got in trouble for just saying F it. I'm going to, I'm going to put my trucks with, uh, automated driving features on the road and have them transport things from point A to point B. I'll take the fine. Um, and, and there were no laws really in place. So these trucks were driving on their own uh, without any regulation. And so what they're doing now is they got this committee together and now they're going to be able mm-hmm. to um, talk with people like Blake and myself who are human factors engineers, human factor scientists, who, um, who will essentially guide them saying, okay, now this, this is a good research area for you to you know, fund go, go fund it. Um, this is also, you know, a good area to put rules and regulations around. Uh, this is basically just going to lay out what Tesla can and can't do with their autopilot, which is going to be like (laughs) super interesting for the car industry. Because I mean, when you talk about drones, the FAA is far ahead of what's going on for cars. Like they've been working. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I, there's plenty of research projects I worked on in the past that that's what they were doing, trying to develop how UAS are going to ultimately navigate in these lower spaces of air, lower classes of airspace. When we're mm-hmm. talking about a car, it gets so much more sticky because you've got all of these problems with vigilance and people driving, and right. then you're basically making somebody do a monitoring task, which we know from a human factors perspective, people are bad at doing, mm-hmm. and we're driving it potentially 80 miles an hour in a car. So it's uh, I don't right. know. I, it'll be interesting to see how all that unfolds and what their what federal regulations are going to look like. Yeah, it's yeah. This this is a good thing. Um, now that we'll have rules around it, hopefully they pick the right people to uh, to help them decide which things should be. You know, but well, don't we it, have automation in some things like trains and and I mean. It's not necessarily automation, but even planes have a little bit of automation with things like autopilot and yeah, just, forces they, and stuff like that, right? They have just a little bit of auto- – yeah, they have a lot of automation. Um, so what they're, what they're really getting at here is um, – this is surface transportation uh, from what I gleaned. So this is, this is actually – like I said earlier, there's no real laws on what Tesla – and others like them can and can't do. I mean, Uber's trying autonomous vehicles as well. You even have, um, uh, there's a couple other companies out there. Google's doing it with their, uh, with their self-driving car. It, basically yeah. what it is, is it's just trying to lay out the rules. What, what these, what these companies can and can't do, uh, for automation. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean, mm-hmm. the big deal will be, is everybody safe while we're doing this? How good is your automation? I'm sure, like, the levels and all that will become very, very rigid as as time goes on. I have, mm-hmm. we're going to get into our predictions a little bit later, but it ties heavily back to this. So remind me to talk to it if I don't speak to it. But for now, Billy, uh, okay. let's, let's talk a little bit about psychology news. What's up? All right, so I'm going to do this like a little bit of an announcer. Are you working a stressful job? Then you might want to sit down for this one. According to a study published in The Lancet, um, heightened activity in the amygdala? I, amygdala. Uh, it's a region of the brain. No, I'm sorry? It was close. Amygdala. Amygdala. Sorry. It's one of those words I know, but I never see on paper, you know? The region of brain involved in stress is associated with a greater risk of heart disease and stroke. Blake, what do you think of this, and what is a lancet? So I looked up lancet because I didn't <laughs> know a, what it was. It's a surgical device. Yeah, it's, it's a, a small surgical knife. Surgical knife. Yeah, but oh, I mean, it's weird because uh, even the article says that it, this itself because you got to be careful when you're starting to really equate brain activity um, with. I don't, it's especially something like this where we're talking greater risk for heart disease and stroke. But having said all of that, even if you think about it, I mean, the amygdala is a portion of the brain where it's, it's associated with both like flight and fight and flight responses as well as like a lot of aggression, especially in animal models, right? So if you're experiencing these mm-hmm. high levels of stress, you're getting more cortisol pumping through your veins, it it could stand to say that like over long periods of time, yeah, you're, you are looking at greater risk of heart disease and stroke, especially if you're experiencing oh. lots of stress. 
Um, so I thought it was a really interesting draw and I always love bringing the neuroscience connection in there. Yeah. And I mean, you know, to me, to me, this is just kind of, eh, I, I, it's like, it's almost like a duh thing to me. Like, has no one really done this before that that's kind of, and I mean, if that's the case, then why not? Um, but I mean, this to me seems like common sense and you'll, you'll often see a lot of those studies that are published and like, wow, no one has done this before. Um, yeah. Even, I mean, they, even in this, this like science daily, uh, article, I mean, it talks about the fact that there hasn't really been this done a lot and this is like right. a brand new, like opening the gates to go look at this. Uh, but it's it's a cool cool notion at least. I mean, yeah, and this will be this will be interesting to look at from a human factor's perspective because I mean, obviously stress mm-hmm. uh impacts performance. And so if we can better understand stress, um, then we can better understand we can we can one, keep our uh users safer because if we can lower that stress, then obviously then they won't have the heart disease and stroke like this study is suggesting. Um and we'll know what a lancet is. This is true. <laughs> All right, Billy, what's up next? All right, so they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but this new study at the Boston University Medical Center suggests that older adults who are physically fit may also be keeping their brains in good shape as well. Old people in good shape perform better in memory tasks and those who are not. So I'm not getting any younger, so I think me and Nick got to start running and doing some lifting. Well, you can borrow my dumbbells this weekend if you'd like. Um, All right, I'm down. <laughs> no, this is this is interesting. Um, again, it's one of those ones to me that, ah, yeah, that makes sense. It's not like it's anything groundbreaking, but it's definitely, um, you know, something that makes sense. I think, I think from, and this is just from my perspective, right? But I think a lot of what it's not saying is I... I think a lot of this has to do with diet as well as you being physically fit. Oh, it goes hand in over, hand for sure. Yeah, over time, because I mean, I, I think that's a lot of what's going to keep your brain so sharp. Oh, I'm sure. I'm uh, sure. But, <laughs> you know, doing deadlifts and heavy squats when you're 75 is still a good thing too, right? Yeah. No <laughs> All right. So Billy's going to be a little bit camera shy for this next one. So I'm going to have Blake read it. Uh, yeah. so let's let's get weird. This is where we get weird. Yep. Okay. So Japan is at it again. A porn company in Japan has, <laughs> has opened a location in Tokyo <laughs> where people can don a virtual reality helmet. I wonder which one uh, to watch pornography. So these rooms are fully cleaned. They have, <laughs> <laughs> they have soundproof walls and it costs roughly five bucks an hour uh, to hang out there and watch porn in uh, VR. So, guys, what are we doing this weekend? We going to Japan? <laughs> <laughs> Billy, <laughs> Billy, are you you signed on for this one? Nah, I'm going to have to pass on this one, guys. I don't really <laughs> uh, go for the idea of going to nudie booths. Which is so weird cuz this is like a VR version of that. Right. But you're still <laughs> you're still going to some place to go put the helmet on to watch porn. Right. Well, I mean, think about it. I, I, a virtual reality system right now is actually pretty expensive to own. Yeah. Right. Even even PlayStation VR, which probably wouldn't even have access to something like this. Um not that I've checked, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, because of all the the stuff surrounding PlayStation's brand, they don't want any of that on their console. So that's the lowest cost of entry. I think you can get an Oculus ready system for about a thousand dollars, Oculus inc- included. So to pay that price, barrier to entry is just way too high, right? But for five bucks an hour, that's a killer deal. Just go kick it. Now I, this is important because I, I think you know, as as funny as the story is. Um, or as disgusting you find it or, or, or whatever. This is, this is people are profiting off of virtual reality and sensations that people want to experience. So they are creating this experience that people seek, that people are seeking actively, uh, and they are making money off of it. I, I think it's, I think it's a great entrepreneurial, uh, wow, entrepreneurial, oh my God, I can't talk. Uh, I think it's a great business venture. <laughs> well, that's that was kind of what I was looking at. Like, it's funny, yeah, I mean, it's people paying to go watch porn, but the model is not that bad, and Nick just explained kind of why. I mean, these things are really expensive to buy, and if it's something you want to go try out, you just don't have the money to do, and it could be kind of a social aspect, not in the porn sense, but like if you were going to go like play VR games like at a at one specific place that you can right. rent the headset. So I don't know. It's a 
it's a silly story, but it's kind of a cool business model. So, so well, one other point too is that you were just saying, Blake. It, it's not just porn. Uh, oh crap! I meant to I meant to warn our listeners. Hey, if you have children listening, uh, anyway, too late. <laughs> uh, spoiler afterwards. <laughs> um, no, this one. So, I mean, it's not just porn. It's it's other things as well. So, like you said, gaming. It's it's the fact that virtual reality is becoming mainstream, and this just so happens to be one of those ways. I can tell that Billy's feeling uncomfortable, so let's move on to the next subject. Billy, what do we got? So the next fix, new original film, iBoy, comes out on January 27th. And so unlike other superhero movies, the, this team gets superpowers by getting a smartphone bashed into their brain. So the in, uh, the trailer indicates that you can tap in and control wireless frequencies, among other technologies. So Nick, is this your new favorite superpower? And uh, when can we bash a smartphone into all our brains? Oh man, uh, this this is a really cool superpower, uh, just from a human factor's perspective. Because I mean, think about it. Like, if he can control wireless frequencies and technology, just the thoughts, that is the ultimate human factor solution. You think it, and it happens. Yeah, it's like the hive mind without having to do anything but bash a cell phone into your head. Right. Oh, you did talk about <laughs> like uh, the brain interfaces earlier with uh, yeah downloading stuff. I wonder if he could do that, if he could download the procedural. Oh, I bet you he could. If it, anything like existed on the internet, you probably could use it. That Ooh. would be a frequency, maybe? Maybe? Hmm? That would be interesting. Yeah. That sounds like a cool concept. Kind of, kind of strange. Know. It's a movie, it's, which kind of makes me want to watch it. If it was a show, I'd be out, but it's a movie. So, so it's a one-time yeah. sync. I just want to watch the cell phone get implanted. It doesn't seem like it can really hold up, you know? Like, what does he do? Solve internet crime? Yes. Yeah, he's cybersecurity. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get to that last piece of weird news, Billy. All right, so the last one I have here is on Friday the 13th, Finn Air Flight 666 successfully landed in Helsinki, Finland. So in Helsinki, the airport is considered H-E-L. So Flight 666 on Friday the 13th landed in the airport of Hell. All right, if you're keeping... So I... I'm thinking that this is the next plot to Final Destination. And how crazy do you think all the people getting on that plane have to be? A little bit a tickle at the back of your brain that something bad's about to happen. You know what's funny? After reading this article, uh, people actually seek out this flight. It's almost like a thrill for them. Um, so they're like, oh, flight 666 on Friday the 13th going to hell. Uh, I'm going to hop on that flight. Um, Just to get a kick out of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, and I bet you the other flip to that, people might not have even noticed, because I I didn't even know Friday the Thirteenth came and went. Right, flight number. Oh yeah, that's true. Not real good at paying attention to them, and a lot of people don't know airport codes. Right. So, so this is assuming a lot of people paying very particular attention. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, obviously the pilot paid attention, and he actually they they talked to him in this article, and they uh, were you nervous about this at all? And he's like, it's just another flight. It's it's just another flight. People yeah. get excited over it. I know. If it creates buzz, though, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, that's going to be... I would also think that some of it would also be cultural. You know, some of these uh, ideas don't hold as much cultural significance, as, you know, in some places than in others. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, if you're uh, in Finland or Helsinki or anywhere over there and you took this flight, let us know um, in the comments or... Send us your videos. Yeah. We would love uh, to oh, see that flight. One last thing. I, I, I got I to gotta show my lack of intelligence for geography is. Where is Helsinki? It's in Finland. Oh, okay. So it's a place in Finland. Got it. Yeah. Yes. All right. I think it's capital? Maybe I'm full of it. Yeah, we, we, uh, us Americans need to get, get our geography. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's it for Human Factors News this week. <laughs> Let's look into the future and make predictions for the 2017 year. What major breakthroughs do you guys feel like we'll encounter in the year 2017? What interesting new challenges will we face in 2017? 20, I can't talk, but 2017. Billy, let's go ahead and start with you. Okay, so the first thing I think we're going to start seeing is, and I recently saw a Simpsons episode of this, 
we're going to start to see more service type jobs going in. Like Uber just started their own version of Grubhub. Uber and Eats. there's like four other Grubhubs that have actually popped up in places. I think we're going to start seeing like little things like order a person to mow your lawn, order a person to make your dinner. Finally. You know, I think we're going to see a lot more service based industries pop oh. up, you know? That'd be cool. Yeah, I would love to order somebody over to cook my dinner for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> How much would that you cost? Know, or clean your house. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, maid service. Um Yeah, I'm trying to think of any any uh, that's that's the possibilities really are infinite with that though. Yeah, cuz there there's like fix your car. The whole idea of those disruptive technologies is they're not they're changing you having to do money transactions person to person. Right. So it's making it almost a little bit safer and easier for everybody. Right. Right. And we're going to start seeing people branch out into simpler tasks. I mean, like you need someone to clean your pool. That's not a complex task for someone to do. You know, that's a YouTube there, video and like a half an hour of your life. There are. um, Oh, I forget what they're called. I think they're like time trades or something like that, where you say, I'll give you an hour and a half of my time. If you give me an hour and a half of your time and you kind of show you kind of say, like, these are my skills. So, like, I could. I could evaluate an interface for you for half, you know, an hour and a half time. And, and, uh, they would say like, Oh, I'll clean your kitchen. And you know, there's the whole issue of communism, whether or not, you know, the, the <laughs> jobs are equally weighted. Yeah. Um, but you still, you're picking up skills. Yeah. Regardless. Well, no, the, the idea and is you always you have the option of saying, no, you don't have to do these things. Right. The idea is that you share your skills though. So, uh, mm -hmm. so like I'm skilled at this thing and you're skilled at that thing. I'll do this for you. If you do that for me, you scratch my back. I scratch yours. Certainly. All right, right Billy, right, right. Billy, what's your next prediction? So my next one is a little bit, uh, is a little bit hot fire. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more political protests Ooh. and a lot more, um, independent news recording on things like YouTube and other channels like that. I, we're going to start seeing more uh, more people going out there and asking around and doing a lot more reporting since this whole backlash of the whole fake news idea, you know? So it's you... going to be bigger. We're going to start seeing more things like that, more rallies, more protests than the news is going to actually be able to put out. So you think the war against fake news is going to spawn fake news? I don't think it's going to fake, start fake news. I think what it's going to start spawning is people like – with GoPros and cameras and cell phones recording these things or that things, putting up interviews and stuff like that, taking it upon themselves to be more independent. Okay. I don't say it's necessarily a good thing. I just think it's going to happen a lot more in the coming year. So is, is this a political statement? Are you, are you making a political oh, statement? What they're doing? Or no, with this, this political protest. Are you saying that there's going to be protests because of the new administration or... I don't even think it's just going to be the new administration. I think, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of that, but I think we're going to start seeing a lot more people rallying behind things like we saw with the oil pipeline and the Dakotas. I think we're going to start seeing that. We're going to start seeing more people filming and paying attention to people who film like major storms that go through or movements that we have, especially if we start registering a whole people and a religion in our country, we're going to start seeing more people do that. We're going to start seeing more people trying to get into more stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty heavy topic. Murder series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, but I, I feel like YouTube and stuff like that is going to rise in that fashion. I totally agree with you. Oh, yeah, that's one of your yeah. predictions. So let's not skip to that one. You know, we're going to start seeing <laughs> more of that. And then my last prediction, and I'm going to tell you, I have this on good authority, you know, good authority because I just hope and pray every day that it happens. But we're going to see the announcement for Half-Life 3. Do you have an inside source at Valve that I don't know about? You know what? It's you know what? Prayers. What me and the people and certain people at Steam talk about is between me and them. I'm just saying. Okay, that's fair. Well, All if right. you could float us a copy early, that'd be real cool. Yeah, we'll review it on Human Factors Cast. All right, Blake, let's get to we your... We will totally review it. <laughs> let's get to your uh, predictions for 2017. What do you got? So we talked a little bit earlier about how I have an iPhone now, um, but I came from Android, and I've played both with their their little AIs. They're either OK Google or Siri. And, you know, it's 
it is super impressive how far that stuff has come in just a short amount of time. I mean, for the iPhone, it's been 10 years. For OK Google's version, I'm sure it's, I feel like it's been less. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you still run those those AI's mental models into walls. Well, and Alexa, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have no experience with Alexa, so I can't speak to that. Right. I mean, I'm just saying that's another one that's out there that's gaining steam. Hey, let's too. not forget about Cortana too. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> she for all those people who have Windows Halo. phones. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like that the the ability of what those things can do, as far as like conversationally, I think that's only going to get better, and I think it's going to happen through mobile phones first because of the amount of data that they can collect continuously. So so you think the phones are going to start listening to us and they'll be able to have full-on conversations with us by the end of 2017? I think so. That's your... Okay. That's me. All right. I'm going to be talking to OK or Siri and having real conversations about esoteric you know, things. You do know we're going to revisit these at the end of the year? Oh, surely. Yeah. And uh, all right. I, I, I would bet... Didn't... I bet no. Wait a minute. Real one. quick. Didn't Japan just announce, though... That they have this home porn assistant rooms? that lives yeah. at your home and will gre- greet you hello and everything? Yeah, porn rooms. Yeah, they just did announce that. Yeah, five we bucks just, an hour. No, We're going. not just... porn rooms. <laughs> <laughs> they have, uh, well, Honda has their, their assistant robot. Uh, is that Osimo? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, right, so we're going to yeah. start seeing that. You might be the closest one, Blake. Who knows, but man? Let's hear what no Nick idea. has to say first. Well, we still got two more for Blake, so let's let's hear what's number two. So, oh, right, huh? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just pretty much moonshot stuff for me, but it's things I want to hear more about. I want to hear more concrete plans about going to Mars from Musk because I think that I feel, I feel like I haven't heard a whole lot of that in the past year or as much news as I would like to about it. So I just, I don't know. I'd like to see all that ramp up before my lifetime well, ends. They're, uh, they're making some pretty great strides with their rocket launches Yeah, and I mean, they're landings. making great strides with their rocket launches and things like that. But as far as and- what happens once they perfected that, I'd like to know a little more about that. Right. I mean, have well, you... they're down to the final thousand people that they're going to say is going to be the first colonists that are going to stay there for a little while. They're down to a thousand people that they're going to send there. Yeah, they're uh, they're really making a lot of progress. Have you seen their rockets are starting to land vertically and they've had a lot less of a failure recently. And it's it's really cool mm-hmm. to see. It's really cool to see a rocket land on its, you know, vertically. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, they don't it, have to do it. It's just a flashback to all that sci fi. Right. All right, uh, Blake, what's your last prediction here for 2017? So I this is kind of funny. I didn't read Billy's prior, but I think YouTube is actually going to become a bigger media mogul than it already is. And mine was going more towards the entertainment side, but I really like what Billy said about the independent news. So I kind of mirror the same. So you're saying this will be like people will flock to YouTube more than like HBO Go or their Netflix or Hulu or any of that stuff. I don't know that it's going to be like a Showtime and HBO for some of the quality, but I feel like it's going to start much more competing with Netflix and Hulu. Well, I also think that, you know, I also think the idea of it is, is that HBO Go and Showtime and Hulu and Netflix, I mean, uh, at least Netflix, all those things do is entertainment TV shows. But YouTube is up to date in the minute, almost live casting most of the time nowadays. Very true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they are very on top of all the live stuff. And that's that's the stuff to me that's most interesting. When you can see stuff that's going on right now, uh, that's a huge advantage over the other two um, sort of services, Netflix and Hulu, that we talked about. Definitely. So, Nick, what do you got? I'm and more and more people are going away from broadcast television. Yeah, more people are cutting that cord. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen to those guys. All right, so, let's, uh, so my predictions here. Uh, the first one I have is... Um, we will experience uh, this year the first Uber style uh, flying cars test. So this will actually take up, you know, um, so this will be either Uber or some other like Lyft or something like that. A service based um, company that will transport a human in a flying vehicle like a drone or something like a human sized drone uh, from point A to point B. And, uh, that in order to qualify this, uh, you know, when we go back and revisit this, I'm going to say it's going to be like a mile test. Like they're going to, they're going to transport a person a mile. So how, how is it an Uber style thing that if it's a test? Well, I'm saying like one of those companies will test this, like, Mm -hmm. like someone, 
they're they're thinking about expanding it so they'll they'll call an uber flight or whatever and then the drone will show up at their house and then it'll fly them to point b i'm saying uber or lyft will perform a test with this technology interesting well they are uber already has helicopters in some cities right but i mean this is this is like a flying almost this is autonomous so this is a drone so so it'll a drone will land at your door pick you up you hop in you hit a button and then you fly to point b I'm excited about that. Think about all the Pokemon eggs I'll hatch. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> this one, okay. I'm, I'm going to move on. We, yeah, we've moved so far away from Pokemon Go, Billy. Let's not. All right. <laughs> so this one, for life. this one is a little depressing, but I wanted to bring it up because at, human, at HFES this year, or last year, I guess, 2016, there was a huge, huge infinite, inf- huge. There was a huge. Was it inf- big? It was big. It was a it was a major emphasis on cybersecurity and the importance that it will play in the coming years. And I feel like this year we're going to experience something uh, like the election, but on a bigger scale. I'm I'm scared to even say it, but I feel like there might be terrorist attacks on our power grid or something. But Maybe not that extreme, but something major is going to happen that will make us reconsider the human factors of cybersecurity and sort of the importance of it Um, because it is a major topic right now. And I feel like we're just right there. It's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been not enough emphasis on human factors in cybersecurity. And you see that in even papers from like the Mm -hmm. late 90s. Uh, and there's con- there's continuous um, like bad security break-ins that happen for large amounts of data that are just never really addressed, like from a HF standpoint in cybersecurity. And I think that it takes specialists to really go and understand the world of cybersecurity, and maybe right. that's why we don't see it. But I would not be surprised if you're right. What do you think, Billy? Hmm. Well, I think that a lot of the public outcry that people are having, like going back to what I'm saying about people like going to news groups and being independent fact finders and things like that for real or fake, I think we're going to start seeing people dive into that stuff a lot more. And that's going to get into the point of almost cyber terrorism with the idea that no no amount of information is safe. I don't know if we're going to be able to actually live in the James Bond fantasy of people getting out power grids or getting nuclear launch codes or things like that. But I can understand the idea of people, uh, none of your actual information being safe and secure yet. Oh yeah, for sure. All right. So this, uh, this last prediction I have kind of plays. Okay. So hang on. What are we, what were we talking about? Oh, the automation regulatory uh, committee. So this one this my prediction for this one is uh, self-driving cars will encounter the first real-world example of the trolley problem. Are you guys familiar with the trolley problem? We are, but no. we should probably like <laughs> break it down for just everybody. I think. Sure. So the trolley problem is: Do you um, a trolley is going down a track, and there are ten people on the rails, and there's a switch, and there's one person off to the side. Do you flip the switch, kill everyone on the trolley? and uh you know save the people on the rails or do you save um the people on the trolley and kill the people on the rails essentially is is what it is it's, it's the sophie's choice of uh you know automation so so what i'm saying here is that self-driving cars uh without a driver in it will experience this so wow all my predictions are really bleak yeah it's not looking good <laughs> yeah you're really dark side here uh. dude well, I mean, I, it had to be said. These are these are predictions that I feel. Well, I don't know. The first flying car test is pretty yeah, flying dope. car, flying That's cars, cool. flying cars. Twenty seventeen flying cars, though. Uh, uh, definitely. <laughs> uh, no, but but okay. So so like, yeah. Do you do you crash the does the auto does the artificial intelligence on board the automated vehicle choose to um, take the life of a child who is in the street? and save the life of the people in the car, or does it take the life of the people in the car uh, or and save the life of the child on the street? Like, I believe that we will experience this problem sometime in 2017, and it will raise a lot of ethical questions. I think you're right, and I think it's, it's really intense because not everybody's going to have autonomous cars when they first become all no. the rage. 
and then how do you control you won't have as much possibility of being able to control those kind of situations if everybody had autonomous cars versus people that are doing both I, I, and so I, you're definitely one right. other thing we haven't really considered and i'm just throwing this idea out here is uh we haven't thought about the the jerk factor yet you know guys who are trying to get in accidents with Google self-driving cars or Uber self-driving cars because they must have so much money. And they try to actually be like, my neck and my back. We're just going to see a whole slurry of lawsuits come out of well, there's, there's a ton That's of, probably going to get people injured. Yeah, well, there's going to be a ton of ethical issues with who is responsible for insurance claims. Is it is it Google's artificial intelligence? Is it the pilot of the vehicle? Like, there's, there's all the... Who's in charge? There's a ton of questions that hopefully this uh, regulatory agency will will address, but it, there's just so much that we don't know yet, and there's so much that we don't know how to deal with yet because it hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, I was going to play a game with you guys today, but let's save it for next week. All right. Because we're, right. we're running tight on time. So that's it for today, everyone. If you have suggestions for games, topics, news stories that you want us to cover... You can follow us on social media. Go ahead and head over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook site. You can comment on our SoundCloud. You can reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. Did you guys like the show today? Do you like our new format? Let us know. We're very interested in what you want to know. Uh, I would like to thank my panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? They can find me on Twitter at UXChillBro. Billy Hall, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter or on YouTube at ComStarCleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. It 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 depends.